This is the web transcription service of the Royal Canadian Military Institute. On May 23, 2018, Canadian art history scholar Dr. Sarah McKinnon spoke to Military History Night about the life and work of Mary Ryder Hamilton, a Canadian artist of World War I and one of the first female war artists in history. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm so happy to be here tonight at RCMI and to meet the membership and also uh, thank a number of my friends who've come along to be a cheering session. That's a section that's always a, a nice feature, so you have a friendly audience. Well, I'm looking forward to talking a little bit about Mary Ryder Hamilton tonight. It's uh, something I've been working on for many years off and on since the 80s when I first uh, was involved in a research project about this woman. Uh, a colleague of mine, at, when I was then at the University of Winnipeg, uh, was doing some research on Western Canadian women artists and discovered a little bit about this story, which was relatively unknown. Uh, we did learn that this artist had, uh, when she went to Europe in 1919, was, uh, had a small sponsorship from the, what was then called the Amputation Club of British Columbia. And that, as Pat mentioned in her remarks, is the forerunner of today's War Amps, the organization that sells you the keychains every year, the key tabs for your keys. But they were in, founded in 1918 as an organization, and they supported returning veterans who came back obviously injured, both physically and psychologically. And this organization uh, began to support uh, soldiers coming back from World War I. So when my colleague and I learned a little bit about that, we went down to Ottawa and we approached the current war amps and Cliff Chatterton, who many of you may know, who's died now, but Cliff was Mr. Veteran and ran that organization for many years. And he was very enthusiastic and helped us in supporting our research and also putting together an exhibition that traveled across Canada in the 90s. Uh, at that time, we wanted to work on a full biography. We got distracted with other things and didn't finish it, but the book was published uh, last October, University of Manitoba Press published it, and that's, uh, as Pat mentioned, uh, was something that uh, is available tonight, but we were able to do. Uh, my colleague that I originally began the project with, unfortunately died uh, and did not see the end of it, but I worked with another colleague who was my co-author on the book. She's in Winnipeg and won't be here tonight, unfortunately, but. Uh, it's through the work of a number of women supporting this woman artist that uh, we were able to finish the project. So I want to tell you a little bit about the biography of Mary Ryder Hamilton and then focus a bit on what her work uh, accomplished during World War I or the years just thereafter. Um, she's a, a woman, this is a photograph from the 1880s. Uh, Mary Ryder Hamilton was born in Bruce County in southern Ontario in a little town called Teeswater, which still exists, and they've now put up a plaque to honor her because she's a famous citizen. Uh, she was born in 1868, and uh, her family, however, moved to Clearwater, Manitoba. They homesteaded in Manitoba. They were United Empire Loyalist family that moved to uh, the West to take advantage of what was there. Uh, in her youth, she was interested in drawing, as many young girls are. She studied a little bit of art, uh, all that was limited. She did a, a kind of an apprenticeship with a, with a woman in southern Manitoba who was a milliner. So she became interested in making decorations and hats. And uh, so some of the photos you see tonight, you see a lot of the, the special treatment, I think, of her, her education as a milliner and as a, as a person of craft and skill. But uh, at the, uh, after she did her apprenticeship, she moved to Thunder Bay in the 18, early, late 1880s, early 1890s. Uh, and in Thunder Bay, she uh, worked in a dry goods store where ultimately she met and married a man who owned the store. So they became joint owners of this store in the 1890s. So this is what she would have looked like about the time that she uh, moved to Thunder Bay from rural Manitoba. And as I said, you see the probably the effects of her, her training. Um, sorry, I went the wrong way here. In the 1890s, she married, and this is a picture of her about the time of her, of her marriage when she was living in Thunder Bay. And again, I think she was a very fashionable and, and uh, well-turned-out uh, young woman. Uh, unfortunately, her husband died within uh, two or three years of their marriage. He died in 1893, and she was widowed at a very young age. She did inherit a certain amount of uh, 
financial uh, support from the business. She sold the business and left Thunder Bay and moved to Winnipeg where she wanted to, to start up a studio as an artist. So she moved to Winnipeg in the 1890s. She set up uh, a studio. She was interested in what was common for women in the day, China painting. They learned to paint uh, decorations on plates. She taught drawing. She taught uh, painting and developed a kind of business and defined herself in the way of being a kind of um, professional artist, whatever that might have been in those in those early years. Um, sorry, I get the hang of this here. She decided in the 1890s, after this time Winnipeg, that she needed to expand her training, that artists to be professional needed to be trained, and so she came down to Toronto and she studied with a man named Wiley Greer, who is a famous artist. He's one of the founders of the Arts and Letters Club here in, in Toronto, and she's um, the woman on the, let's see, on the lower right, the second one in, with a kind of a tie that looks like a man's tie. So she joined an art class in order to professionalize her training and her education and lived in Toronto while she uh, was working on that. She again considered that she needed to move forward with her, I'm sorry, with her training. And she decided that going to Europe was the way to learn to be an artist. And in 1901, she went with a friend, a Winnipeg friend, uh, Jean Isabel Culver, and they traveled, as you can see, across the, sh uh, the sea on board ship so that she could go to Europe to study uh, in a proper way. At the time, in the first decade of the 20th century, Paris was a real center for the training of artists. It was very much an international community with people from Russia, the States, other countries in Europe, all going to small uh, academies and studying traditional arts in, um, in Europe and she went there and, and joined a couple of different schools in order to receive what she considered to be a professional training. Again, she, had, she wasn't wealthy, but she had inherited uh, from her husband's, um, her husband's estate enough money to take this professional training. And she traveled around. The common thing in Europe was to go to visit other centers. She was studying in Berlin and in Paris, but she also went to visit Holland, Spain, uh, here Italy in order to see what uh, artistic influences and to learn the history. I mean, many of you have probably been to Venice and are familiar with this scene in St. Mark's Square where the, the women were visiting. Again, the hats are always a wonderful feature here of, of the dress in the, in the early 20th century. While in Paris, she studied both traditional painting uh, and learned the techniques that were expected of, of painters of the day. As with many women painters, she specialized in a number of, of traditional uh, ways of painting. Uh, portraiture was important, still life genre painting, that is painting of scenes that were traditional, and she became quite proficient in those traditional ways of learning. This piece um, is uh, as a result of a trip she took to Brittany. Uh, she went out to Brittany to look at the the rural areas of France, uh, La Petite Penitente, it's, it's a Breton girl who, uh, you can see the wooden shoes and her uh, small rosary that she carries dressed in the traditional dress of a Breton girl. It's a, it's a portrait of this young woman. The portrait actually belongs to the Winnipeg Art Gallery and it, it is on exhibition quite regularly. So her work did become known eventually back in Canada, but this work was painted in 1903 when she was an art student. Her, uh, at the time, she, she worked with a number of uh, traditional studio methods, one of which was to work from a life drawing, and she had a traditional model that worked for her. This piece called Maternity was, in her mind, her best work that she ever produced uh, when she was studying art in Paris. Uh, she was there about 10 years altogether. Uh, this work, Maternity, about a mother and child scene, this was a live model that worked with her quite frequently. And you can see the, the kind of traditional approach here to the mother and child scene. This work, by the way, upon her death, which I'll talk about at the end, um, was willed to the city of Thunder Bay because of her marriage and early years in Thunder Bay. And it is on display at City Hall in Thunder Bay, if you're ever there. This work is still a part of their heritage. They're very proud of Mary Ryder Hamilton as a citizen of their city. But she valued it throughout her life and, and had wanted to sell it. It 
but in the end uh, donated it to her former hometown. Uh, after her training in about 1911, she came back to Canada. Her mother, in, living in Manitoba, had been ill. She had family connections, and so she returned from her studies in Europe and did a tour across Canada. She was interviewed in Montreal, Ottawa, Toronto. Exhibitions were held of some of her works. Uh, she went out to visit her mother, who lived in western Manitoba, and this is a kind of unusual photograph, a sketch of her, a photograph of her sketching uh, a sitter, and again it illustrates her interest in doing portraiture and in kind of traditional art form. So here she is coming back as an artist now trained in Europe, and she's uh, traveling across Canada. She did a series of landscapes of Alberta, BC. I mean, she was interested in the in the tr the countryside of Canada and as a subject matter. But interesting, I think the point that's uh, important here is that she considered herself to be a professional. This was not a woman who was painting in an amateur way. She took students. She operated a professional studio, and she considered herself a, a professional trained artist. That's unusual at this time in the early 20th century that a woman would would expect to be seen in this professional light. But here she again visiting her mother in western in western Manitoba. Just to give you an example, when she came back from France too, after her 10 years there, uh, she came back around 1911. She's still obviously interested in hats, but was a very uh, refined person. She was uh, again not a bohemian artist that you know that may have been a, a part of a certain culture in France, but you see that she was conventional in many ways and uh, traditional. When she returned from Europe, she spent a little bit of time in Manitoba, uh, coming back, uh, had some exhibitions in London, she, or, or in, in Winnipeg, and then she decided to move to Victoria. So about 1912, 1913, she moved to the West Coast. Again, I think for the opportunity, she felt that that would give to her career. While in, in uh, Victoria, she became friendly with a number of members of the society there. Uh, it's, we believe that she also knew Emily Carr, who at the same time belonged to another artist club and artist organization. Uh, at the time, uh, she worked for, she received a commission to paint portraits of the Lieutenant Governors of, of British Columbia, a series of a large number of portraits which she was commissioned at the time. This is an example of just a sketch. Um, this was a friend of hers whose husband was a minister in the British Columbia government, so the point is she seemed to be in the right levels of society and to be pursuing her art with patrons and with an interest in working with women and with uh, teaching and, and uh, exhibiting as much as possible. Well, at the end, as you know, Victoria, in the years before the war, was um, uh, uh, interested as British Columbia in what was happening in Europe. Ultimately, when the war broke out, um, she was in a way caught. Her intention, I think, had always been to go back to Europe. But when the war broke out, of course, it wasn't possible to go back to the, the life in Paris uh, that she had known before. And so she, um, as I mentioned, I think, or as, as uh, Pat mentioned in the introduction, she had been interested in the war effort. While in Victoria, she volunteered for a number of, of uh, charitable uh, operations. She ended up um, working on uh, fundraising, the bandage rolling, the art being sold to, uh, to raise funds for the soldiers. She was very active in supporting what they could support for the war effort, uh, as they were very concerned. But in a way, that wasn't enough. And as we know, in 1916-17, she applied to go to Europe uh, when it was announced that Canada would be sending official war artists. Uh, she wasn't selected, and the reason was that they didn't accept women. There were later in World War I uh, Canadian women war artists, but they normally painted the home scene, what was being done in the, in the back back home to support the, the forces, but the idea was not to, to send them there. In the end, uh, A.Y. Jackson, some of the other, some of the other famous uh, group of seven artists did go uh, as the artists, that you, people that you may have known, but women were not allowed. So she was officially turned down. We do know that she was interested as a very patriotic woman and in supporting the war to go, but that didn't happen. So as the war came to an end, she didn't give up on her idea. 
And as I think Pat mentioned, she was friendly with a man by the name of J.A. Patton, who himself was a war veteran and amputee, who came back to Vancouver and supported, started an organization to support veterans. She approached him and again said, I think it's important to document what Canadians have seen and done in World War I. She was concerned about the, the soldiers that came back who were wounded, whose families would wonder where they were, how they had served. She was concerned about families whose sons never came home, but the names of the famous battlefields would be known to them. But again, in an age before easy photography and the exchange of information, those, uh, those places were not commonly known back in Canada. So she uh, thought the idea would be that she would go and document these, and she offered her services to go and document. At the time, the, the organization, the British Columbia Amputations Club, produced a magazine for veterans called The Gold Stripe, and they wanted to publish some of these in their magazine so that people could see reproductions of these various places that, that were being discussed. So she convinced them to give her a, a, a partial commission, they didn't pay for everything, but a partial commission, so that she could go back to France. And her idea was that she would send back these memories or these illustrations. And she was extremely concerned about this from a patriotic point of view. It wasn't a flighty idea that she just wanted to travel in France, although I think she was a bit of a Francophile by this time. but. She seriously wanted to go and do something. And I can give an example of, of a quote or a couple of quotes that just illustrate her interest. Uh, she was interviewed when she came home, and this is what she said. I made up my mind that where our men went under so much more dreadful conditions, I could go. And I am very proud to have been able, even in a small way, to commemorate the deeds of my countrymen. And especially, if possible, to lend a helping hand to the poor fellows like those of the amputation club who will be lifelong sufferers from the war. It is fortunate that I arrived before it was too late to get a real impression. Um, so she, she left Canada in 1919 in March. She uh, went via New York and on a, uh, the boat over. She had letters of introduction from the Canadian government well, and from the British to allow her to go out to the battlefields. The battlefields in those days were you know, it's interesting, there was a sort of tourist uh, uh, issue here. People went out to the battlefields to see what was going on. There was even a Michelin guide that told people what to see when they went out to the battlefield. So there were other people out there. Uh, there, was also, there were also cleanup crews that were removing the, the leftovers of the war. Uh, and she, uh, when she went, she lived on her own mostly, sometimes in a tent or in a hut. And this is an example of the kind of accommodation that she had in 1919 when she arrived. These were simple huts that were on the battlefield. She was there on her own, and now at this point in her life, she's about in her 50s, so this isn't exactly a young woman, and there was a certain safety and security issue about being out on by yourself in areas where safety wasn't primary. And this is a kind of famous picture of her with her easel dressed for a day of painting, and she always had dogs with her, and you can see her protection. So this is an example of, she, she went to the areas in northeastern France and Flanders, where major Canadian battles had been fought, where with the names of places, Arras, Vimy, uh, Passchendaele, places where uh, Canadians would know the names and be familiar with what had happened there, and her idea was to document these scenes. So this is an example of the life she was living out on the battlefields, um, having made that, that decision. The kinds of the paintings that she produced, there were over 300, generally were done on commercial board or small subject. I mean, after all, she was working out of doors. They are not large canvases. The one on the easel here is one that I happen to own personally. It was a gift to me from Cliff Chatterton in the War Amps because the first works that she produced were sent back to Canada uh, to be illustrations in their magazine. This one is called Camp Vancouver, and so it would have been relevant for a BC audience. They were scenes of where the, those particular soldiers would have been. But the first group that she sent back went to the, to the amputation club and they were published in the magazine. After that, she continued working uh, and there were almost 300 works produced. 
And as I'll tell you in a moment, most of them were donated to archives, which is now called Library and Archives, then Dominion Archives, now Library and Archives Canada, and they're in Ottawa. So most of the works are in the documentary art and history section. They're not publicly out normally, at, say at the War Museum or at the National Gallery. They're in an archival documentary place. I think that's one reason why she's not very well known, because they were not published or publicized in the way that some artists were. At any rate, um, she, when she got there, she seems to have had about two or three themes of things that interested her. One was a simple documentation of what you might say is, you know, documentation or landscape, just what does the war look like? And um, this is an example of what she would document. Sanctuary wood, uh, where you can see the trees have been, um, are, are dead, and the landscape has been, sorry, has been destroyed. Um, sorry, I'm going the wrong way here. Uh, so you get a sense of the desolation of the landscape. Um, she wrote in a journal, she wrote letters back, and she wrote in a journal, which is very interesting. Here's an example. She said, the first day I went over Vimy, snow and sleet were falling, and I was able to realize what the soldiers had suffered. If there is something of the suffering and heroism of the war in my pictures, it is because at that moment the spirit of those who fought and died seemed to linger in the air. Every splintered tree and scarred clod spoke of their sacrifice. Since then, nature has been busy covering up the wounds, and in a few years, the last sign of the war will have disappeared. To have been able to preserve some memory of what this consecrated corner of the world looked like after the storm is a great privilege, and all the reward that an artist could hope for. So for her, this was a really sensitive, almost spiritual experience. It wasn't simply copying down what she saw. She was very moved by these scenes. So this is an example of a kind of landscape scene. Uh, here, the sadness of the Somme. Again, desolated uh, landscape with the trees that had been dead trees, the, the bare landscape, the empty roads. This is what she wanted to document. What is the basic landscape like in France for people back in Canada who, who didn't know that? So uh, she looked at some of the signs of the, what had been left from the war the interior of a pillbox in Flanders, so a fortified place where soldiers had been. You can just see in the middle of the picture a bit of an optimistic sign of puppies or flowers coming back to grow over the landscape where the uh, battle had been raging only earlier, and then again the desolated landscape in the background. This was uh, her attempt to, as I said, document, almost like photography, uh, what she saw there. Another example, dug out on the Somme, most of, as you know, the war effort around the Somme, where the Canadians were, was a complicated series of battles, but here, again, a place that was really not reconstructed as yet when she documented it here from the, the time of the battle scene. So she went around and looked at what was there of the, the scarred landscape that she could show to Canadians uh, in, her, in her art. Another example of, here she is out on uh, the road with her rolled up uh, art supplies under her arm and her dog to help her along the way. So the point here is she actually went out and painted on site of what she saw on plein air, as it's, it's called in French. She made sketches, she would document, go back, finish works in her uh, hut, or sometimes she did go into town to do that. But generally she was very active in working in the landscape setting itself. Another, another series of works uh, we'll see have to do with um, specifics, but I, I thought I'd show you this one. It's a sort of controversial piece which I, I can't really answer, and some of you who know more about the history of World War I will, will know more. Um, she entitled it The Tragedy of War in Dear Old Battered France. That's her term. What this appears to be, and again, I don't have answers, is a kind of crucifix with a piece of human body hanging from the arm. This is the way it's been interpreted. Um, there is a, and again, I'm, I'm sure some of you know more out there, there is a bunch of literature about, uh, and maybe um, a legend or a notion about crucified soldiers in World War I, that there was a tradition that and a rumor that soldiers had been pinned up against a door or a wall and crucified uh, in the course of the war. 
I don't think this has ever totally been proven, and, uh, but there are stories about, uh, that have to do with uh, that history. Sorry, I went back. The, the other interesting thing about this work is that she could have never seen anything like this because going as late as she went in the period after the war, there would not likely have been such a scene visible to her. Uh, because it wouldn't have lasted even if it had happened. So this is again a kind of interesting question of whether this is about her her concerns about the war, her thinking about something that happened. Was it a story that she was told but didn't see? Uh, it's an unusual situation and this is the only piece of the art that I know in the large collection that has any sense of violence or, or, um, or, or horror to it. Most of her works, as you'll see, are much more positive. But this is sort of interesting piece and uh, why she did this, whether it was as a result of hearing stories or uh, something she saw is, is difficult. But it's certainly a reference to the horror of war and the shock of, of what happens um, in the war. A second group of her paintings do have to do with very specific locations that she visited where she knew Canadian soldiers would, would be interested. So she went to see the sites that were famous. So here, Petit Vimy and Vimy Village, uh, so a site that was well known in the news back in Canada. Of course, four years after the war, you don't see the destruction, but you see the village and just a sense of the, of the landscape itself. She also went, as I said, she was in, in, up in Flanders, and here the Lille Gate, a particular monument to the Battle of Ypres that she knew about. So again, she documents what was in 1921, obviously afterwards, what was left of that site so that, again, people would understand the specific locations. I should say, too, that, that her idea was to be a documentary artist, but I think, as I said, to some of the things that she is doing here, there is something of an aesthetic as well. It isn't just about being a cold-eyed viewer of, of something and documenting it. You can see her sensitivity, her, I believe, her, um, her sympathy for what's going on is very strong as well. She is very committed as a patriot. It isn't just about, you know, looking at something and documenting it. And so you see here, um, I think an understanding of what she's looking at as well as it. A number of things that she covers are cemeteries, and these were of course important to families back home who knew that a son was buried in a certain place, but they didn't, they'd never visited, they didn't know where it was, they weren't sure what it looked like. So she very definitely went around and looked at specific sites, specific locations here, and uh, tried to show these. Again, I think in looking at her work, it's not it's a cemetery, but it's not negative, it's not cold, it's not dark. It, there is a sense, I think, of flowers growing, of rebirth, of something rather positive about what she's trying to show uh, in, referen in, in referencing what happened um, in this area. Uh, here's a very famous Canadian uh, scene, Passchendaele, the Battle of Passchendaele. She went here to depict a particular monument that was made. You can see reference to the soldiers in the form of uh, the helmets, the, the, the guns, the swords up against the monument, but again, I'm sorry, but it's the, it's the, the uh, simplicity and the monumentality, I think, of, of something that, again, a Canadian back home would want to understand, to see what that place is and to recognize that Canadians had been honored there. So she specifically went to sites like Vimy, like Passchendaele, um, Hill 70, places that she knew were important for Canadians so that she could send back that, that information. But again, it's not horror, it's not tragedy, you don't see destruction, you see a more uplifting understanding of what had happened um, in those places. Uh, sorry, I'm turning this thing around backwards. And again, here's a particular regiment that she was knew was Canadian, the Princess Pat's Canadian Light Infantry, Cemetery. This too uh, documented for those back in Canada who would would understand and that particular location. So she does have some not only general landscape as I showed you, but specific places that she felt needed to be documented. Here's an example of. Uh, you might notice she's aged a bit and looks a little different from 
the young woman in the picture book hat, but you can see behind her, in this case, a photograph that shows you the kinds of cemeteries that when they were first done with the simple wooden crosses that were not even painted at first, but eventually were. Here she is uh, in one of those cemeteries that she had painted um, frequently in the examples that I showed you. She, her health suffered. She had, uh, she became quite sick at times with various problems. She lost the sight of one eye. She was determined to stay and finish this, but she did deteriorate um, in her own health. As I say, she was in her 50s by the time she took this on, and uh, it was difficult. She writes letters back home to a friend in Victoria. She didn't always have anything to eat. She suffered from the cold. I mean, it was a very challenging job, and although she'd had some notional support, she didn't have any real support. This was very much an individual uh, effort on her part. But she wasn't always um, negative and pessimistic. What she also wanted to illustrate for Canadians was the way in which the world was coming back, that there was going to be regeneration, uh, rejuvenation, hope that the scene of renewal was going to take over. So a number of series of, of her paintings uh, do talk about what uh, she saw as optimism. This is actually slightly mistitled. It's filling the shell holes in no man's land. So it shows workers going back to try to recover the landscape and restore it. And again, a, a sense of getting back to normal and repairing the land that had been damaged. And again, she goes and observes this being done. Here, clearing the battlefields, this was a big job to remove any, and as we know, not everything was removed, but removed um, various weapons and, and presumably the, the detritus of war, the various uh, damage that she could find and burning off certain things. And so she documents what is like here to go and, and clear away the damage of the war. Also, a, a kind of optimism in a way uh, here She's painting a scene of, you know, the world goes back, community comes back when the war is over in these towns, you know, a, a community comes together again. So here is a market where even though the city is damaged, the town is damaged, um, people do come back together to restore their lives and to live the way they normally do. So a kind of market scene in the ruins of uh, a damaged city um, where she shows life coming back to that community. Here is uh, called The New Home. Most of the ones I'm showing you, by the way, are from Library and Archives Canada. They are ones that are in the Canadian uh, public collection. So here's a re repurposing of one of the huts, rather like the one I have here from Camp Vancouver. So this family is repurposing the hut into uh, a home. Again, there's little references to puppies, to flowers that are coming up, that are a restoration of normal life coming back in the countryside to show that the world is turning around from the horrors of war. And she does document that in a positive way. This is, again, another close-up of the kind of hut that she was in. This is a little bit... Uh, a different view. These are some old photographs that we got that you can see are not in very good condition. The reason I put that there is for you to see the shape of the building because this is what the hut was like inside. And so you can see these commercial board or, or uh, little uh, cardboard pieces she was painting on and as she painted them she would hang them up on the walls and, and mount them there to look at them. And this is a it's an old and not very good photograph but you can see her profile there on the lower right side and you see how she worked inside when she had her sketches and her ideas and then converted these into the scenes of the landscape that, that we were talking about. So it's a little bit of idea. I can't totally read what is written up on the rafters there. There's something about the morning to wear but I can't read the whole thing but whether she put that there I imagine she did but this is the working environment to, that she had. And here's Eat Market Day, again, the restoration of the world in a little greater detail as people come back together when the war is, uh, is over and the world begins to work the way it should. This is a scene from Vimy. I'm showing you this because I wanted to give you a little sense of her painting. Here again is a sort of optimism 
with crosses and flowers, even though they're placed in a, an area of destruction. But what's interesting is this is a photograph of the same site from later. And you can see how closely she actually did document what she saw. This is a, a scene of a broken wall, as you can see, a cross. And if you go back, you can see how close it is to what, it, what she documented was actually what she saw in that scene. I'm not sure the date is correct on this, but the location is definitely the same. Um, and uh, one of her most famous works at the end is again, I think, a painting about optimism and about the positivity. Uh, it's a trench, a battle trench on the Somme, but what you see is the f poppies from Flanders Field, or in this case from the Somme, which have now grown over and covered that uh, place where the battle had raged before. And I think it's a symbol for the way she looks at the, a positive change um, and coming out of World War I. It also, I think, illustrates the point about aesthetics. She's not simply a documenter. There is something of artistic merit and interest in, in what she's doing here with color, with the composition, and so forth. Well, in, in she finished her work in about 1922. Uh, in fact, this is what she looked like. As I mentioned, she had a glass eye in her left eye, and you can see that here. She had been ill, and this was an exhausting activity these three years. Uh, she stayed on in France. She was awarded um, something called a Palme Académique. It's the second highest honor in France, uh, below the Légion d'honneur. Uh, she was the first Canadian to receive it. Um, it Nobody knows much about this in Canada because it wasn't, she wasn't as famous in Canada. Uh, the exhibition of these paintings uh, was held, there was an exhibition held in the, the Opéra, the lobby of the Opera House in Paris, um, showing her war art. It was also scheduled to be shown and some of it was shown in London. But shortly after the war, the interest in World War I things began to decline. You know, the World War I was, was not uh, it was a horrible time, and although people had been so optimistic and positive early, as time went on, it became less a glorious thing to celebrate. Uh, she had she stayed on in Europe. Again, she had financial difficulties. She um, wanted to do something to support the soldiers with her art, but she didn't want to sell it. She felt that was wrong. And so she, in 1925, went back home to Canada. She packed up the work and uh, managed to pay for passage and get home. Uh, she had envisioned a national tour of her painting, but it didn't happen. Uh, she couldn't get the support for it. In the end, she, she tried to give the works to the National Gallery. They weren't accepted, but they were accepted by Arthur Doughty, who was the archivist in 1925, and she gave them to Canada for, for no charge. They were just a donation. And um, she came home, she went back to Winnipeg, she started to set up an art teaching operation again. It wasn't very successful, so she moved to Vancouver. By 1929, she was on the welfare rolls. She could not support herself. She was ill. She had no income anymore uh, and no way of showing her art, although she kept trying to get exhibitions and to show her work and to take on students. Um, she was a ward uh, of the welfare by 34. She was in and out of bad health in the 30s and she was committed to the hospital in the late 30s. She was in Essendale, which is a psychiatric hospital then, and she had senile dementia, she was malnourished, she was indigent, and in, it's very funny, she was, we have some word notes, and in the 40s, in 1942, she told one of the doctors that she was an artist and she needed to get out of the hospital because she needed to go and paint camouflage on the planes for World War II because she was an artist. So you know she was a patriot. I mean, she still thought, I need to get out of here. But she was out of the hospital in the 40s. Uh, she improved and had a few late exhibitions in Vancouver um, when she, her work was shown you know, in the homes of her friends and so forth. And uh, in 1954, she checked herself back into Essendale. And uh, she had a heart attack and died you know, she had nothing really, and this was, um, she died a few, la a few days later. So it, it was a sad tale of someone who wasn't really recognized much uh, for what she had done in her lifetime. And lots of reasons that you might say, well, she was a woman, she was from Western Canada, she, 
documented something that wasn't a great moment in some ways, but it, it seems really tragic that someone who was a professional artist was not in her own lifetime fully recognized. When she died, uh, her, she had a nephew who looked after it, and as I said, she was her painting that her favorite painting was returned to Thunder Bay. She her she was cremated and her body was returned to Thunder Bay, and she is buried next to her husband who had died in 1893 in Thunder Bay. And uh, I've done some work with the Thunder Bay Museum there, and a few years ago they got some poppy seeds from Flanders and they planted them on her grave. So the city of Thunder Bay is is very proud of her as a, as a resident, and they do celebrate her work. Uh, but she's uh, an interesting part of. Canada's story, I think, in the history of World War I, which isn't uh, as well known as it might be. I should say that uh, one small thing, and then I'll uh, take questions if you like. Um, I've been working again with the War Amps and with Canadian War Museum, and next uh, September 20th until March, uh, the Canadian War Museum is going to have a small exhibition to honor the 100th anniversary of the War Amps and their contribution to Canadian veterans, and they're going to show Marietta Hamilton's work, they're going to show Cliff Chatterton's medals and some prosthetics and some various things to do with both the War Amps and her work. So should you be in Ottawa next fall or in those six months, her work will be on display at the Canadian War Museum. So I think that's terrific that that uh, contribution is going to be honoured. Thanks very much for your attention and I'm happy to answer questions if I can. Yes. Any questions? Uh, Professor, I have, I have two, if I may. The first one is easy. Uh, I'm wondering if in the 1890s, when she was trying to establish herself in, in Winnipeg, if she was submitting paintings to the RCA uh, competitions every year, and, and what came of that? She, yeah. she had showed in her, her training in France, she showed in the Salon, and in fact, maternity and a couple of those had been shown professionally in France. And she was setting up exhibitions or trying to get some with her own work and that of her students. So there were, there were exhibitions in Winnipeg, sort of local. But at that point, in the 1890s, she, it wasn't a big enough thing. As it went on in the, in the early years of the, of the 20th century and when she came back home in 1911, there were shows in Montreal, Ottawa, uh, Toronto, um, Vancouver. So she was getting a bit more official attention. And there are magazine articles and reviews of her work that was quite positive. It was a more traditional kind of art, as I mentioned. But there was some attention paid, but it didn't seem to turn into a long-lasting... But nothing from the Royal Canadian... No, I, no, I don't. She wasn't a member of the RCA, but, but she had had some shows that were, were publicized in, in the big cities, but no, unfortunately. And the second, if I may, the, you said they ended up at the archives mm -hmm. at, at a time when the Canadian War Memorials Fund had, had gone to the, to the art gallery. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, did she offer it to them? Was it turned down to yeah, she was, join the, the body of Canadian War? It was turned down by the National Gallery, and there was, I didn't get into the detail, but there was a lot of politics. She had friends writing to Mackenzie King, and, you know, there was a real interest in, could you support this woman, and, but it, it didn't seem to develop, there were various political differences, but I don't know whether, I mean, my own thinking is that, you know, there is an aesthetic and an artistic element to this work, but the subject matter, I think, you know, by the 20s, I don't think Canadians were very positive about World War I. You know, it had been glorious in 1915, we're going to go over there and take care of this, but, you know, every town in Canada, or Ontario, has war museums and broken people and people that didn't come home, and I think by the 20s and 30s, you know, scenes of World War I were not as interesting. But the gallery said no, they wouldn't take them, and so she in the end approached the archives and, and they did. So I, I don't know whether, unfortunately none of her pieces belong to the War Museum. This exhibition I mentioned is going to be borrowed from the archives. So no one has, now her work is still for sale. You can see it in, uh, you can buy not the war art so much, but there are times in the auction houses in Canada, she's known as a Canadian artist, but not for, you know, for the war art that is available. And indeed, in the, in the early 20s, the Beaverbrook collection had gone into storage. Right. And, you know, she was interested in that whole thing, but she wasn't accepted for that. Right. It went into storage. It was just World War I art seemed to be not 
in vogue. And I think she was so connected with it. And then by then, you know, she was old, ill, not able to manage her career anymore. You know, she couldn't, the advocacy was hard. She managed through the 20s to advocate, but after that, she really wasn't capable. Yes? Professor, two questions, if I may. First one, when she went to France um, if for the 10 years, uh, 1901 to 1911, what did she live on? Was she eating into the funds from selling her husband's business or whatever? Yeah, I think she had the inheritance. They had this dry goods store, which they owned together, but uh, it's in the book, but the details, they sold the business and she had an inheritance from him. He was a successful merchant. And I think she used those funds to uh, launch her trip to Europe and her studies in art and with the idea of becoming a professional artist. So yes, in, in those years she had money. She also was trying to sell paintings back in Canada through a friend of hers in Victoria. So if they could sell something, she would get the money sent to her uh, and so forth. But yes, generally it was about the inheritance. But that didn't last forever. And then when she got to France, it certainly was difficult when she was there during the war years. Mm -hmm. uh, the second question was, um, stylistically, how would you classify her art? Uh, some of it looked something Group of Seven-ish, mm -hmm. some mm -hmm. of it looked realistic, yeah. some of it was it is, uh, pre pre-war. I, I would say it, it was traditional sort of post-impressionism, you know, the loose brushstroke, a sketchiness. It's, it's um, documentary and realistic. It's not... Cubism or other things that were going on in Paris in the first generation or first decade of the 20th century, which was becoming very avant-garde, but it's traditional uh, painting and it does remind you of Group of Seven. Some of those trees, for example, the landscape settings, it is a traditional, slightly abstracted landscape, but I think it is conventional and she learned those conventional paintings, uh, traditions of perspective and space and color. Uh, so I think that's what was being taught in the academies in France in that period when she was a student. It was along those lines, uh, not radical painting, but conventional, traditional, learn the basics uh, of a sort of post-impressionistic world, which obviously did influence Canadian painting in the later in the 20th century. So very much so. Thank you. Yes. Did you say, in your opinion, her lack of acceptance, if that's what you wish to call it, was that based more on the subject matter of her paintings, or do you think it was based on the fact that she was a female in those particular times? Well, I think the first the first part of her career, she, you know, before she, the war painting, she was doing very conventional work for women, and she did have some following at the time, some exhibitions in Montreal. She was reviewed in the papers in Montreal, Toronto, Ottawa. She had a following. Um, the war paintings, I think, was an interesting patriotic, became almost an obsession that she wanted to do this, but then I think there wasn't a demand for that work. That she couldn't go earlier and be part of the war artists, maybe that would have meant her work would have been noticed along with theirs, but um, I, I think part of it was her, the relevance of the subject matter, and as she was getting older, it, she just sort of disappeared, her health and so forth, but the, the work didn't, uh, although there were some letters written and some nice things said at the time of the donation, the work wasn't really shown and it, it didn't seem to get um, the attention in Canada. After, I think it was because the war by the 20s was just not something that people want to be reminded of. Yes? That was going to be my point mm -hmm. with tying into the, in the 20s is when the Group of Seven is coming to the fore so that people are trying to put the, the war behind them and mm -hmm. embrace this painting that's showing the landscape of the country. Mm -hmm. In a more positive light, right? It's, it's the beauty of nature and landscape, exactly. So I just think it, the time moved on and, and her ideas of a sacrifice or something valuable, you know, things changed. And although it was valuable to some people, it didn't have the national reach or anything when she got home. Sarah, mm -hmm. is um, she unique in the kind of lifestyle that she chose as an artist, or are there others who did something similar? I mean, I was struck by the fact that that she went off on her own mm -hmm. into this sort of still dangerous territory. Yeah. I, I think that was quite quite something, and she had to get permission from the government. But I think that was very unusual. But 
She managed to get some support from starting with the amputation club and then some in military. When she first went out there, there were some Canadian troops still around and she got some protection, but then as things cleaned up and they moved away, she was more and more on her own. But I think that was really true. I mean, many women artists don't have the freedom to get up and do that. I mean, even in, in her age or period, if she'd been married or had children, she would have not been able to do that. And so I think she was very independent and that was unusual. And, um, but she was quite conventional in some ways and I think she found it really difficult. But she felt there was a higher goal and she was quite committed to this project. Um, but yes, it was unusual, I think. This has been another in our series of webcasts produced by the Royal Canadian Military Institute in Toronto as a public educational service. You can find news of upcoming events and links to our webcast archives at www.rcmi.org. On behalf of the RCMI, this is Eric Morse saying goodbye for now and thank you for joining us.